Welcome to Fantasy Creates Reality. One of the reasons this podcast exists is to try and create a bridge between science and soul. And one of the people I think does that best is Dr. Stephen Harding. He is quite a character. He's an ecologist, one of the co-founders of Schumacher College down in Dartmoor. Um, he worked with James Lovelock on Gaia Theory, and he's the author of two incredible books, Animat Earth and Gaia Alchemy. He's a really delightful man. I love his manner and his way of talking. I love his, his dedication to science, but also to deepening and expanding science so that it includes reason, intuition and emotion, as well as that scholarly practice, that kind of hard won knowledge and learning. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with one of the most delightful human beings you're ever likely to meet, Dr. Stephen Harding. Well, yeah, thank you, Ben, for giving me the opportunity to sh share some memories. Well, it happened at Schumacher College. He, he taught the first course at Schumacher College. And I'd just come back from Nepal, where I'd been in a, in a Tibetan monastery for three months. And before that, I'd been in, Cost in Costa Rica, pretty much, you know. Um, and I didn't know where, where I was going in my life. Um, and anyway, I ended up as, as the resident ecologist at Schumacher College, you know, through, through Satish Kumar and Tagore and all sorts of strange connections. And to my amazement, the first teacher was going to be James Lovelock. And that's when all my doubts vanished about following this path down to Dartington, you know, and not going back to Costa Rica and all of that. When I knew that it was James Lovelock, there was that call of destiny, you know. There was something very, very, very important um, meeting him. So I knew that very deeply, even before I met him. I knew this is very important. This is why I have to be here for some reason. And then we met and we, when he came to teach, and it was just lovely. We got on so well. I mean, what lovely, really nice. And with his wife as well, it was just lovely. So just just a warmth and a sort of mutual understanding. It was very moving, really moving. It was just lovely. And we went for long walks in the countryside. And more than the science, you know. I mean, we I understood what he was saying entirely, of course, and about the science. And he was delighted because, you know, I think he had too high a view of me, actually, to be honest with you. I mean, because I'd been at Oxford, you know, and did my DPhil at my doctorate at Oxford in the zoology department with Bill Hamilton and Richard Dawkins. I mean, it was a real um, centre for neo-Darwinist, selfish gene kind of thinking, my department. And Bill Hamilton was was the guy who really developed all that. And I was, you know, I've, I had coffee and tea with him regularly. Um, so... <laughs> So Jim thought, oh, wow, I think he overestimated me. I don't know, maybe I'm being too humble, but Stefan, you know, he's from that stable. Well, I am from that stable. I am, you know, but I never bought it. I never bought the selfish gene, although it made me feel sick when I first heard it. I really, the months of my revival, I felt sick in my stomach. Not because it was wrong, but because it was what's so one-sided. It's not wrong. I mean, there's aspects of truth to it. Of course there are. And the only, but I never met any other scientist who saw it like that. No one. No one. All the ecologists, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but all the ecologists I was with in Venezuela from the Smithsonian Institution, I mean, really great scientists, with a, maybe a few possible exceptions, but Everyone bought into it, you know, it was just, you were, you were marinated in selfish gene, marinated, and I, I didn't like it, I didn't like it, I refused to accept it, but I didn't know why. Why? I had no arguments. Their arguments were so powerful, I, I had no arguments. And then I met James Lovelock, and I realised, oh, he's on, this is the right track to putting the selfish gene in its place. The emergence of, for example, in his Daisy World model, you know, you have these selfish, it's a mathematical model which he created, which is just beautiful. I mean, what a work of genius. He had called it his greatest invention. You have these dark daisies and light daisies, and together they compete for space on the planet. 
which is irradiated by a, a sun that's growing in brightness. And together they regulate the temperature of the planet really beautifully over time, even though the sun's getting brighter and brighter, despite the fact the equations tell them to, co to, to compete. They cooperate. And there's no equation for cooperation. It just emerges out of the mathematics. They cooperate. And co they cooperate-compete. Co co you know, it was amazing. And we talked about that, you know, and um, we got on very, very well. And then he, he, and I learned so much. And then I, of course, thinking of the Earth in that sort of way, of Gaia as a, it was a very powerful seed idea that got planted into me through him. And then he said, well, come, come and visit me whenever you like. So I, I didn't go and see him for a few months after that. But it was, I mean, you can tell it left a big impression. Um, the impression I often use is like, um, having the most friendly guide taking you, sometimes by the hand when necessary, to the top of Mount Everest. And on a very peaceful, sunny day, being there together in silence, just looking out all over the vast panorama of mountains. I swear to you, that's what we, we had that quite a lot. Because before Lovelock, <laughs> it was, life unfolds against the backdrop of rocks and non-life. But Lovelock told us through mathematical models that they co-create each other. That's a major element of his contribution, is that right? I think so, I think that's right, yeah. Yeah, Daisy World, his model, which I worked on with him for about five years, that was my scientific collaboration. I would go off to see him every now and again, every few months, to his laboratory on the edge of um, the Cornwall-Devon border. In a really lovely wild place, you know, it's beautiful. I think he had 13 acres which he just let go wild. And it was, he had his laboratory there. He was an independent scientist, you know. Oh, I can't, I mean, you, I, you just knew you were with a real genius. I mean, it was just amazing, really. I'm not the only one who felt like that. Anyway, back to the idea, yes, you're quite right, Ben, that's the idea, that the, the idea is that the, before Gaia, before Gaia theory, rather before Gaia hypothesis, before Lovelock, the mainstream view was that the planet is a dead ball of rock with a thin smear of living organisms on the surface, so get used to it, everybody. Life is just a thin smear, it has, it's just puff, puff, nothing, just thin smear. You know, what really sets the conditions are the volcanoes. They they have uh, they're part of the rock tribe, so the rocks through the volcanoes are in charge, if you like, because they emit greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, like uh, CO two, uh, which, as you know, is a greenhouse gas so that sets the temperature of the planet. And the poor old living beings, they have to just adapt to those conditions, or they die. They have no influence on on what the surface is like at all, or hardly any. That was the view, and it was, it was a paradigm, you know. Thomas Kuhn, a paradigm, or in complex systems language, a basin of attraction, very strong one. Just about everyone in science, in this kind of field of science, was stuck down there. You know, selfishness, machine worldview, the planet is a machine, dead. I, I know that view because I've, I was taught it from a young age and it it's a, has a very bad effect on young people. Well, it had a very bad effect on me. Although, it's not the only reason, but it made me feel very disconnected, you know. So Lovelock comes along and he says, I mean, f for good scientific reasons, which I could tell you if you want, it's not just, you know, it isn't just coming from, from the dream world, but of course the dream world is very much involved. With Gaia, that's that's what's so interesting about yeah. it. Yeah, I would love to come to to that the um, depth psychology. But okay. Let's ground it in the science All first, right. okay. so no one can say yeah. these guys are complete new age flakes. Yeah. Because what I want to do with this this okay. series of conversations of films is make a bridge between um, okay. science and, and soul. Okay. okay, good. Well, I'm a scientist, you know. I mean, I am. I mean, I got my doctorate at Oxford. Um, on the on behavioural ecology of the muntjac deer, which is 
really serious field work and serious you know, data analysis and all of that. So I'm, a sci I mean, I'm, I'm well grounded in science and in ecology, what's more, field biology, muddy boot, quantitative muddy boot biology, ecology. I say that with pride, you know. And um, people would say, oh, look, you're a muddy boot ecologist. Yeah, I'm a muddy boot quantitative ecologist, you know. It's, it's a matter of, I would carry these heavy batteries in my, on my shoulders into the woods to record activity patterns of mud jack. And I'd spend days and days radio tracking them from the edge of the wood, living in a little garden shed, you know, reading thorough. And I, you know, and I analyze the data on the computer. And it's, it's really quite a process, that. So I know what science is. I do. At least I know what my branch of science, I know what's involved in doing science. It's very rigorous, very demanding. And Lovelock fulfilled the demands and rigor of science in his description of Gaia as a scientific concept. I mean, it's been incorporated into, into mainstream science in that, in that it's in the, all the climate models that are used now to predict what's going to happen with climate change. They're all Gaia models. They've all got the biota in them. Is it okay? Working okay? Yes, yeah. They've all got, you know, you, you can't ignore the impact of life. I mean, just, but we're going in different directions. You, you wanted me to, I want, I want I wanted you me to, 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 um, to, to establish the scientific credibility for Gaia, right? That's the first yes, thing. Yes, yes, please. Yes. All right, then we can talk about the, okay. Well, as you were saying, Lovelock first saw Gaia in data about the atmospheric compositions of Earth, Mars, and Venus. And he, was, he, did, he, got, he started looking at these data because he was working for NASA in the 60s, early 60s. And they wanted to send a lander onto Mars to see if there was life there. You know, we're sort of fascinated with life on Mars. We always thought there were little green Martians and whatnot. And people used to see canals there, you know. From, they thought there must be civilizations and whatnot. So the idea was to send a lander, and they needed, NASA needed people who are really good at inventing instruments, and Lovelock was the best in the world, probably. I mean, he invented the electron capture detector, a tiny little thing that was used to detect DDT all over the place, and later on CFCs, I mean, really major important as an in importance as an invention. It triggered the environmental movement, that invention of his, electron capture detector. He gave the data for it. Silent Spring was connected with that, you know. So it's not a joke. And he was very well known, so they invited him over. And then I won't cut a long story short. He realized that sending a lander onto Mars to look for life was, could well be a waste of billions and billions of dollars because what happens if the lander lands on a little patch of Mars where there happens to be no life and it does a soil sample or a regolith, no soil, sorry, but a regolith sample and there's no life. Well, okay, maybe 20 meters away over there, there's a thriving little puddle of life or something. You've missed it completely. He, he started thinking, how can we detect life at the level of a whole planet? Instead of just focusing on small areas of the planet, it seemed too reductionist to him. How can you think? How, how can you detect? Is there a way of detecting life at, at the level of the entire planet? And he sort of got the idea. If there's life writ large on the surface, it's likely that it'll be extracting raw materials from the atmosphere to build itself, and that it will release waste gases from itself, waste gases from its own metabolism into the atmosphere. And that would make the atmosphere um, very low entropy, or very unlikely, or far from chemical equilibrium, because it'll be full of gases that react with each other. Um, and then the uh, there's life will constantly keep refreshing those gases and that there in that way will oppose the general trend that would be there without life for the atmosphere to react with itself chemically until it came to a stasis and a chemical equilibrium stasis of high entropy you know just that's it that's all there's left just carbon dioxide basically so he said if there's life on mars and on venus their atmosphere should be like the one on Earth, which is indeed very far from chemical equilibrium, entirely because of living beings. I mean, we have about 78% nitrogen in our atmosphere, which is cycled by bacteria, you know, constantly cycled. If it weren't for the bacteria cycling it, it would react with oxygen and, and just be washed out as nitrogen oxides, and that would be it. 
but bacteria recycle the nitrogen. And the oxygen, of course, we now know that comes from, it comes from photosynthesis. And that's about 20%, 21%. And these gases react with each other because oxygen is a very reactive gas. And there's also methane produced by life with which oxygen reacts to produce CO2 and water. So Lovelock knew that the atmosphere of Earth is far from chemical equilibrium because of life. I mean, it's amazing. Other people must have thought that, but not quite in those terms, you see. Not in terms of a life detection experiment. And then he got the data for the atmospheric compositions of Mars and Venus from a, a telescope in France. The two French scientists had analysed the atmospheres of Mars and Venus. You can do that from the Earth of the telescope. If you have the right kind of spectrometer, you can do it. And those data landed on Lovelock's desk, and he saw Mars' atmosphere almost entirely, 99.99% carbon dioxide, same for Venus. And then... He walked in the corridor at NASA, <coughs> thinking about this, you know, how, 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 how stunningly different the atmosphere of Earth is to the, those of Mars and Venus and in, in their chemical pom compositions and in their chemical reactivity in the case of the Earth, or lack of it in the case of the other two, right? Mm. And then he bumped into a, a scientist at NASA who'd been working on the oxygen concentration of the atmosphere. That was his specialty. Doing using rocks, various measurements you can make in rocks. And he bumped into Lovelock, and they started talking. And this oxygen scientist said to Lovelock, oh, did you know that the level of oxygen in our atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, has remained around 21% for 300 million years? That's what we think from the evidence. And Lovelock didn't know that, and he was quite struck by that. And then sort of he began mulling these things over, as a good scientist does, you know. People think intuition isn't part of science. It is. It's very important. Mm. Uh, he, knows how to, he knew how to use intuition. He, he used it very skillfully. And imagination. And imagination. So anyway, he did that somehow. I don't know. What, he was still very young then, but he did. Anyway, then one afternoon it suddenly dawned on him. Or dawned on him. He, he writes this, I think, in Ages of God. Uh, he says, it's like a flash of enlightenment. Can you imagine? That's one of the greatest experiences in science when you have a flash of enlightenment. It's really lovely. There's a sort of ring of truth about it, you know. Anyway, the, so the idea, that what came on him was this. Could it be, and I sort of paraphrase him here, could it be that life on Earth, on this planet, had not only made the atmosphere, in other words, produced the gases that were far from equilibrium and recycled them, that life on Earth had not only made the atmosphere, but also regulated it over vast periods of time within the narrow limits suitable for life itself. See, now that, that's a phenomenal idea because it puts life... I, I wouldn't say it's... Well, it does put life at centre stage in that formulation. It puts life, it drags life out from the obscure place it had been placed by the paradigm of the mechanistic Earth. It's the biosphere that's running the whole planet, running the surface of the planet. It's being run by the biosphere for the benefit of the biosphere. It's an amazing idea. And of course, the selfish gene people jumped at that really quickly because they said, hang on, all the organisms are selfish. They're just looking after their own local interests. I mean, it's a good, this is a good argument. So how are they going to... What, how can they know what the temperature of the planet should be? You know, there was Doolittle, Ford Doolittle, one of the main opponents of Gaia hypothesis, who's now coming round to Gaia. It's very interesting. Over uh, the last 30 years or so, he's finally realised, hey, there is a way. And the argument was, natural selection can only act on locally selfish individuals. How can they know... What, how can an earthworm in the soil know what the temperature should be of the planet, or even of its local environment? I mean, some, I think Doolittle may have said, do, do all the organisms gather on Mount Ararat once a year to discuss what the temperature should be? And it was a good criticism from a scientific point of view. So that's when Lovelock invented Daisy World. 
he needed, as you said, he needed a mathematical model to see how it could work in principle. With selfish organisms, the daisies, they're, they're mathematically selfish. And, you know, it produces emergent self-regulation over vast periods of time. It's amazing. Emergent self-regulation. Yes. Over vast periods of time. And so that life can only exist within a narrow band of, of, of temperature. And the sun has been expanding and increasing it, its temperature um, in relation to, mm -hmm. to Earth. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you would think that life would have been completely fried. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't been because the planet as a whole has been able to maintain th yeah. this thin band yeah. of temperature. Yeah. And, and the idea right. is life is, is doing that and they dismiss that as teleology. That's right. Uh, life would, there'd be a purpose. You know, there would be a purpose. Teleology is a great sin in science. You're not allowed to think there's any purpose in anything. If there is a purpose in biology, it's to get your genes into the future generations. That's, and your genes are in control of everything. They control all your behavior. They make you unbelievably selfish. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but anyway, um, so, but then the idea morphed. It changed, you see. How, how did that happen? I think after Daisy World, it changed. And I think, I think Lovelock realized somehow that actually there, there are four components to, the, uh, to Gaia. And they all are equal partners. So that's much better. Mm. Because the life interacts, well, the, and the four interacting partners are, not giving priority to any of them, are the rocks, all the rocks, including probably all the way down to the outer core of the Earth. Uh, and even the inner core in, is in some way involved, you know, which is the temperature of the outer surface is the temperature of the sun. And it, it runs plate tectonics, that massive radioactive decay that's going on beneath our feet, and massive energies, huge. So that's the rocks. And the liquid rocks. And the liquid rocks. Although they're not as liquid as we think. I still haven't quite understood about those rocks. Anyway. There's the rocks, then there's the atmosphere, which we're familiar with, you know, but we take it for granted. And David Abraham is very good at pointing out that the atmosphere is, you know, the importance of the atmosphere. And then there's uh, rocks, atmosphere, water, all the water, the rain, the oceans, the rivers, the streams, the lakes, the bogs, all the water. And then, then the life, the biosphere. They interact together as equal partners. And it's out of that that the self-regulation emerges. And so that's what uh, he called the Gaia... F that was later called the Gaia theory because more evidence from the real world piled up in, in its favour, such as the fact that... I think, well, there's maybe just mentioned two of them. Um, one is the long-term carbon cycle that you mentioned earlier, that you guys were meditating on, I don't know, you did a sort of, I can't describe what you were doing. You can because we were reading your description. <laughs> <laughs> Inanimate Earth. No, but I mean, I, I, I see what you mean, our experience, yeah. Your experience is, is what I, I mean, I'm, it's wonderful that happened. Mm. Um, so anyway, we, we have the science of that, you know, we can, we're, people have made mathematical models of the weathering of granite and basalt assisted by life, which takes CO2 out of the atmosphere that weathering takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, and calcium from the rocks. And they together wash to the rivers where marine algae take them up into their bodies and they precipitate uh, the calcium and the car uh, carbon that in the form of calcium bicarbonate into calcium carbonate into chalk. And when they die, their bodies sink to the bottom of the ocean and then they make, they make vast deposits of limestone. And that whole process has cooled the earth because it's taken CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's very slow, but it's, but it's sort of relentless, really. But then the problem is, OK, if that, if that keeps going, I think someone's calculated, if that keeps going, if nothing returns the CO2 to the atmosphere in about a million years, which is nothing for Gaia, a million, I, I think I've seen this calculation somewhere, um, the Earth freezes over completely because there's, no, there's not enough carbon dioxide to stop the Earth from freezing over. Uh, and so something's had to happen to restore 
the CO2 and therefore stop the freezing over of the planet. And th what does that is plate tectonics, you know, the rocks. Because they, the rocks, they carry that. Now imagine this, the rocks, they carry the, that limestone to the edge of a continent, the two plates. Here's, there's some rock, some limestone rock here, you know, like this. And there's another, the two, two plates meet. This is seafloor basalt, seafloor basalt. Limestone rock on the top from dead coccolithophore algae that have produced calcium carbonate. Every carbon atom was once in the atmosphere. Whoops. And they go, they crash together, these plates, and this stuff gets subducted, the limestone gets subducted. And it melts in these deep temperatures, high temperatures, it melts. And CO2 is released and it comes out through volcanoes. And that restores the temperature. And at the same time, fresh granite is made which be becomes new continental material to make up for the stuff that's been weathered away on the surface. And you do the math, it's been modelled mathematically, very nice, very, very skillfully. So it's credible, it's a credible process. And the, the key part of it is the life on the granite rock that's weathering the granite more and more, it wants minerals from, it wants nutrients from the rock and it's weathering the rock. And that increases the contact rate between CO2 and, wa and rainwater and the rock surface. So the weathering happens up to a hundred times, I've read a thousand times in some places, faster than it would do without life. And that's, the, that's what makes the regulation so fine, because the life is very sensitive to temperature. Give this to us again, this rock weathering. Take us in, in, into what's going on there. Um, mm. How can we imagine and, and feel okay. what's going on there? I'll bring my rock. rock. The whole story of how Gaia regulates temperature. Can I hold one? Yeah. yeah. Is, um, is, involves the relationship between these two kinds of rock. Chalk and granite. The, 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 the movement between the two of them. So in here, I'm answering your question about um, you know, the weathering. In here, imagine there's lots of calcium princesses, calcium ions. I prefer to, I mean, calcium ions, yeah. But I prefer to think of them, I like to personify them. So they're not just, you know, this ob dead object calcium. This is, these, are, these are sacred beings. The calcium, every, every atom, every molecule's got a spark of the sacred in, within it, right? Yeah, and they're not passive, dull princesses. They are dynamic and potent ones. Yeah, they're very poetic princesses. Each one, everyone's slightly different, you know. And out here in the atmosphere, there's the carbon, carbon prince. And um, in the form of a carbon dioxide molecule. So he's got these two oxygen equiries, if you like. And the carbon prince and the calcium princess are longing for each other. It's just, they can't help, it's just part of nature. Calcium and carbon, they want to make chalk together. That's what they want to do. <laughs> but the poor cal carbon prince, you know, in the sea, he's, he can't get into solid rock. I mean, I'll try, right? I'm going to breathe CO2 onto the, onto the rock. It's all coming back in my face. There's no CO2 going in there. Because there's these electrical charges and the magnesium ions and other, ion, other beings, I imagine, that are repelling. It's, a sort of, it's an electro, electrical repulsion that's going on. So the CO2 has got the wrong elect, elect, electrochemistry to get into the rock. Wow, this being has electricity in your hand. I think so. Yeah, I think, of course, there is. There's electrical. That's what's holding it together. I think of it. It's just dense. The air can't get in. Yeah. It, well, it can't. But it's not. It's dense, and it isn't dense. Hmm. It's both. Now, what happens is that carbon needs the help of someone who can sneak into the matrix of the rock, um, and for whom the rock isn't dense at all. I mean, it's really dense for the carbon dioxide and the carbon prints within the carbon dioxide, because he bashes his head against it every time he tries, he gets a headache. But if he can find a small friend, very, very, very small, for whom this is a, this is a vast space, then maybe they can rescue the calcium princess for him. A thief? No, not a thief, not okay. a thief, no, not a thief. Well, I, I don't know, maybe you, I don't know, I mean, you just have your imagination, your own imagination about it. <laughs> I think, <clears throat> Maybe it's a thief, yeah. Anyway, so what happens is the CO2 needs help. So it gets together with water in 
molecules in the rain. So it rains onto the rocks. And the water, water molecules in the CO2, they, they really like each other, you know. They just, CO2 dissolves very happily in water. Water is so welcoming, it dissolves so many different kinds of things. I mean, not everything, but lots of biomolecules, for example, dissolve in water. Amazing stuff. And so the CO2 dissolves in the water. And then, of course, something new is born, which is carbonic acid. Um, and this carbonic acid, I think, if I remember, is H2CO3, two hydrogen atoms, one carbon atom, and three oxygen atoms, and it's negatively charged, H2CO3. It dissociates into CO3 minus, a bicarbonate ion, CO3 minus, H, no, HCO3 minus, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, but with a single negative charge, and it really releases that little tiny being the carbon prince has been waiting for. And that's a hydrogen ion, H+. plus. doesn't even have an electron, it's just a positive, just a proton. Very, very, very small. And it's so small, the pro and loads of protons are produced, and the protons are so small, to them the rock is a vast space, you know, with a magnesium here, an aluminium there, a calcium there. I mean, it's really, and they can go right into the rock. And all the sort of magnesium guards, etc., on the surface, they don't even see it. They're like ants trickling past the cold stream, the feet of the cold stream guards into the palace of the rock. And there they find the princess and they say, they actually, because they've got a positive charge, they start interfering with the electrical attractions that hold the rock together. And it starts liberating the calcium princesses and silicon and many other beings are liberated and they flow out and they meet the bicarbonate, uh, the calcium ion, sorry, the, the bi HC3O minus, the bicarbonate ion. So now we've got hydrogen, hydrogen little being, calcium princess is now free in the water outside the rock and there's that bicarbonate ion which is holding the carbon prince and they all get together and they become calcium bicarbonate. Now the prince and the princess can see each other. They're not married yet, but they, they're seeing each other. Ah, there you are, there you are. But <clears throat> calcium bicarbonate is very loose, and so the calcium and the carbon princes separate, and then they meet new calciums and new carbons, and they get flushed into the river, onto, into the rivers. Say in here, the river Dart, which drains Dartmoor. And I, I, I like to think that as they're traveling down the river, the calcium princes and the calcium princesses, is they're, they're, they're in a kind of dance reel situation. You know those re countryside reels, what are they called? Kaylee. Kaylee, that's the word. <laughs> but back to the rock. So if you just have um, water, bare rock, and CO2, the weathering happens very slowly. It's very slow. But if you have life growing on the rock, imagine this is a big huge boulder, you know, we'd be, on Dartmoor, we'd be maybe that big. There'd be trees growing on it. There'd be bacteria, lichens, fungi, and there'd be soil full of, full of millipedes and bacteria and earthworms. And they'd all be acting like a gigantic mill, breaking the rock apart, getting nutrients, m minerals out of it that they need for their life. They need to mine the rock. I mean, the ones who are doing it first are the lichens, of course, you know, very good at weathering rocks and producing soil. And so all of that produces a tremendous surface area for the CO2 and the water uh, to react together and extract the calcium princess. And what's more, the soil acts like a sponge, you know, and you get these particles of calcium silicate, that's to say granite or basalt rock suspended in this rock, in the soil, and water full of water and carbon dioxide. There's an amazing biological enhancement of the weather. I'm not sure if I've given you a feeling for it. It's very, very important. You know, can you feel that life is just, wants to get its roots into this rock, has to, to get minerals out. And it's a whole progression from the lichens and the bacteria to the mosses, then the smaller plants, some sort of flowering plants, and then eventually small trees and big trees. They're all, and the trees put their roots into it and they crack it open. There are even bacteria that find their way into little cracks and swell up when it rains and expand and break off little flakes of granite. 
I mean, it's hard. It's you have to really emphasize how big that is. You know, it's it's a real rock. Rock life is a rock crushing organism. Rock dissolving, rock crushing, or which increases the con contact rates between the carbon princes and the calcium princesses, and the water, of course. But I've read a thousand times in the tropics, but I don't know. I've, I think it's more, from what I gathered, more like a, up to a hundred times. Okay, right. Okay. And it's temperature dependent. Mm. So imagine that. Good. So there's a feedback. There's a feedback loop, a regulating feedback loop. Well, anyway, so, so basically, if it gets too hot, and say it starts getting really hot, l imagine the volcanoes produce loads of CO2. That, that's, that means more rainfall, because there's more evaporation from the ocean, and the temperature's gone up, so that's really good for life on the rock, and they start weathering the rock like mad. And you get lots of CO2 sucked out of the rock and sent down to the ocean, where the marine algae precipitate it, and it goes down into the limestone. And then it gets cold. Mm. Yeah, it gets it gets colder. Yeah, the heating of the atmosphere quickens the catalytic processes in the rock, the rock weathering, which increases the rate of um, creation of of limestone, locking away the yeah. CO two in these limestone That's vaults, it. cooling yeah. The, yeah. the atmosphere. Right. All right. Now, once the atmosphere is it's getting cool now. I mean, may I imagine that a lot of that carbon has been taken out of the atmosphere. It's going to be rather cool. But there's now less weathering going on. So the CO2 can build up from the volcanoes. And it's not being weathered out so much because there's less life. Because it's cooler it's not, and drier, it's not so good for the life on the rock. So there's, they're not weathering so much. So the CO2 can build up again and the temperature goes up. But when the temperature goes up, the weathering starts kicking in again and brings the temperature down. That's a, a self-regulating dynamic. Incredible, outrageous. That's been shown mathematically, you know, by, sci by my fellow scientists. Although they're much more able than I am in mathematics to do this kind of thing, and I think it's pretty much accepted that, that that's the case. And so that's that's why the hypothesis, the guy hypothesis, has morphed into the guy theory. But not just that; there are many of these. Well, um, there are um, many. Uh, Self-regulating feedback loops. Yes. There's also clouds. We should mention clouds. There are algae. Lovelock was involved in this, f discovering that certain algae emit cloud-seeding gases, and those clouds cool the earth. Cloud-seeding gases. Marine algae, the same ones that produce the shells that make the chalk. Ameliania huxley. Yeah, Ameliania huxley. Um, Coccolithophores, which in Greek means carrier of little stone berries, coco, uh, berry, litho, stone, chalk, four, carrier, coco, litho, four. And they have sort of circular... Some of them do. Some of them have mandala-shaped uh, coccoliths, as they're called. Beautiful. You, can, you should try and show a picture of them if you're going to... So, so these guys seed clouds. Cloud, they release a cloud seeding gas, dimethyl sulfite, which is the smell of the sea kind of gas. And they seed clouds, which, which have dense white upper surfaces, and they cool the planet. Well, they're, they're part of another feedback, regulating feedback loop. They do cool the planet. But if it gets too cold, they don't grow so well, so then the dark ocean surf surface is exposed, and that warms up the surface and the planet, which means the algae grow better, which means they seed clouds, which cools the planet. Right, because the white surface is like um, mm. a magic mirror. It's a mirror. That's it. And that we now know that the forests, many of the forests on the land surfaces do the same. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the, there's more to the Gaia science, but that's probably in, in Yeah, that is great. Fantastic. Um, let's have a small song. You could play guitar and I will say a poem. Oh, will you? All right. As you play. Good, eh? Thank you for, for that science. Yeah, a bit scientific, wasn't it? <laughs> I was trying <coughs> not to go off into the animism because I thought that's what you wanted. That's what I want. Was it? Yeah. No, you. Yeah. Anyway, you handle it. You handle it however you want. Now, is this is this good or do you want something a bit happier? Whatever you feel. Okay. Fishers catch fire, 
dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rims in roundy wells, stones ring. As each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow flung flings out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. Deals out that being. Indoors each one dwells. Selves does itself. Myself speaks and spells. Crying, what I do is me. For that I came. I miffed up the bit, the playing bit, but I hope no one notices. Yeah, I probably got the words wrong. No, no, you didn't. That was perfect. Gerard Manley Hopkins. I know, I know. You know, you know I, was, um, I was reading Gaia Alchemy, and because um, I, I love that poem, I turned the page and oh, like, yeah. there it is, he's put it in the book. <laughs> it's fantastic. There's another one I used to know that David Abraham recites. Invisnade. Yeah. Oh, God. Now I've forgotten it. Isn't it terrible? I used to know it off by heart. This darksome burn, horseback brown. His raw rock high road roaring down. In Coopan and Combe, the fleece of his foam. Flutes and low to the lake falls home. A wind puffed bonnet of fawn froth. Turns and twindles over the broth. Of a pool so pitch black. Fell oh, frowning. frowning. It rounds and rounds. Despair. To drowning. Degged with dew. Dappled Degged with dew. dew are the groins and the braes that the brook treads through. Wiry heath packs, flitches of fern, and the bead bonny ash that sits over the burn. What would the world be once bereft of wet and of wildness? Let them be left. Oh, let, let them, them be, be left. left. Wildness and wet. Long live the weeds. And the wilderness yet. You know, Stefan, I um, used to install small micro hydroelectric power stations and I would map them using software to figure out their economic <coughs> value. You would do that? Yes. Goodness. And great. I mapped that river. Did you really? In the Snade on the east side of Loch Lomond. Really? Yes. <coughs> wow. And so uh, I felt ambivalent about doing it. Mm. But of course, as you, as you know, being an ecologist, we have to make stairs for the fishes. <coughs> yeah, yeah. The river gets its water before we take it down the pipe uh, to blast onto the wheel to create electricity. I'm sure it's small scale, though. Small scale, low impact. So, so you were doing engineering, basically? Yeah, for, for a time, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. So we were just working for a company and they told you what to do? Or? Well, no, we, we start, started one. Me, my dad, my brother. Really? And that is my dad's partner. Cool. Um, yeah, we were sort of a hydroelectric pirates for seven years. <laughs> All our systems worked very well. Oh, really? You built well. them yourselves? Uh, yeah, yeah, as part of a team. We, um, uh, a Buddhist engineer called Richard Drover would uh, design and make the turbines. We would weld the pipe together, build the, the intake on, on the river nice and snug and make sure the fish get their water. With concrete? Would you concrete it up the places? We did, we did use concrete as, as little as possible. Um, but we did use concrete and we had to somehow get all the materials to the top of the mountain um, which without building a massive gravel track up there like all the other bigger companies did uh, so we were the uh, agile little uh, hydro ninjas carrying it up and, and who was using the electricity? <laughs> amazing uh, yeah. local communities used really? and they're still uh, going? Uh, goes into the group yeah, yeah, so well, we decided to, to stop and uh, resume being artists again of various flavours so it's a temporary thing to get some money. <laughs> unbelievable. Anyway, anyway. That's um, unbelievable. <laughs> so here now we're, we're moving from um, the realm of matter, which we've been talking about in a, a beautiful way, into 
psyche, psyche just being the Greek word for soul. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to try and define soul because that's um, a fool's errand. Mm. Um, but instead, we've got something that can, can help us get a sense on it. Um, James Hillman felt like when he says soul, he means the same thing as uh, people when they say soul food or soul music. Um, uh, 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 it's, it's a soulful experience. You, you, you're on your deathbed and you're looking back at your most precious memories of your life. And those are soul, those have soul, they, they, they are soul, they're imbued with soul. So there's this idea of psyche, where does the psyche end? Does it end in the brain? Does it end at the, the skin? Maybe it has no end. John Viveki, cognitive neuroscience, working on this idea of distributed cognition. Cognition is distributed. It's not only going on in the brain in isolation. It's more relational and it brings in ecology. And we have this idea of the anima mundi, the soul of the world. So then we have, we have a soul, I have a soul, you have a soul, but the world has a soul. That's creating a boundary between inner and outer and maybe even that's not right or those boundaries should be much more porous and permeable. Some people consider alchemy as the hidden spiritual tradition of, of the West and a kind of practice of soul with matter and this for me is, is what makes alchemy super interesting because the alchemists were working um, intently with with physical things, with um, minerals and, and and chemicals and sulfur and salts, and it was so uh, uh, richly imaginal. You know, they had like um, complex stoves with many many ways of making fire, sand baths and water baths and bain maries and um, the whole uh, um, imaginal textural terrain of, of, of alchemy is so rich very different from a sterile laboratory um, and they're working like really intently with with um with the physical matter of the world sometimes metals but sometimes uh, salts and sulfur sometimes not even literal salt or literal sulfur or literal mercury it's sophic mercury and that's something different um, and they have this sense that there's not really a separation between uh, psyche or soul and matter they are interpenetrated and interanimating and so the soul in matter wants to 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 uh, to do something they, they want to cook with it they want to um, release the the doves of Diana from the sophic mercury um, and yeah. they uh, and as as they're working so intently with their their, their, their materials their, their, their cooking ingredients they, they enter into such an altered state of consciousness, not eating or sleeping for a long period of time, and they're in such an intimate relationship, all their focus and attention is on the ingredients that they're cooking with in their alchemical experiments, that the boundaries between them and their materia, as they called it, start to dissolve a bit, and they feel themselves, their own psyche reflected in the alchemical alembic. So as they're cooking, with matter, they're also cooking with their own uh, psyche, their own soul. And in our world, matter and soul and matter and spirit have been divorced. And I can feel now in the culture that they're trying to come back together again and reunite um, in many different fields. You can see this happening. Um, and part of what I want to do with the, these conversations is bring a bit of of light to that so so that it can happen itself more, more quickly um, and, and, and beautifully. But you've written a book called Gaia Alchemy that is a bold book that like not many people would attempt to do this <laughs> because the, the, the interconnections within Gaia are incredibly complex by themselves and alchemy is so multivalent and, and complex and difficult that just alchemy a study of alchemy is, is, is a bold move, but you, you're doing them both together and you're trying to integrate them. So what I would like to ask you is, is um, what gave you the, the, uh, 
the, the impetus or the desire to attempt such a, an outrageous task? Hmm. That's a great question. And by the way, a great summary of what alchemy is. Very good. So, I don't know what it was, you see. I just listened to it. I didn't know what it was. I mean, what happened was, is all circumstances that were behind it. I was, I was doing a lot of soul work with my, real, my great friend Julian David here at Luscombe on his magical estate at Luscombe, just a few minutes' drive from here. For several years, you know, I'd go and see him. And it's, oh, we had a wonderful time, really great. And he had a library in this old, lovely, old, beautiful old estate of his. It's in a barn, a ramshackle sort of bare wooden stairs, bare wooden door, swallows nesting on the way up. And you enter this sort of low, well, sort of big barn, but very, very, very ramshackle in the nicest possible way. Not ramshackle, but you know, well used and worn and old and quite a lot of light. And at the end, there's a curtain, beautiful curtain with a sort of pre raphaelite pattern on it. And through the curtain, there's the, the Jung section. Of the, the of the library. The rest of the library's got all sorts of things on, on art and all sorts of things. But beyond that curtain was the Jung section. And of course I would go in there. It's a very magical place. And there was some particular, I remember these green volumes about this high, um, which drew my, drew my attention every time. And I would pull them out, you know, or you just read. This being Jung being Carl, Carl Gustav Jung. Jung. Carl Gustav Jung. And these green volumes were mimeographed, mostly unpublished, I think unpublished at the time. Accounts of talks he gave on psychology and alchemy and individuation during the Second World War. Um, at ETH in Zurich, I think it was. And he, one of his students, I think Barbara Hanna probably had kept notes and written them all up. And I would go back and back to these, you know. Um, and they were about al al they were very about alchemy. There was one, the last volume particularly spoke to me when I would open it in the library, you know, having spent an hour with Julian doing soul work, going into my dreams, and I don't read Jung. It was as if he was speaking to me. It was as if I could feel the alchemists. I felt like I was one of them. I felt like I was, I'd come home in some way. I didn't, you know, I really felt that this is very important. It was a very comforting feeling, very comforting. Although I, a lot of it seemed beyond me, I never thought I'd be able to perceive what on earth he was talking, what on earth they were doing. But I just liked it, I wanted to hang on to their coattails, you know. Anyway, I said this to Julian, and he said to me, oh, you can have one of those volumes, just choose any one you want. So I've got the one he gave me, and I've been studying it. And, and somehow, through studying that, um, and also I, I must mention my friend Geoffrey Keel, who is very much important, very important because he uh, was, he's retired now, but he was one of the world's top climate scientists, you know, really understood Gaia really well, and a Jungian analyst, and really into alchemy. And we were, we were he came over, once, about three summers ago, and we spent a week together discussing alchemy. I've put some of those conversations in the book. That was in the brew as well. You know, that, I, I, we continued to, to speak with each other. Anyway, then it just sort of felt, felt right for me, since I spent so much time on Gaia, um, and loved the science, but found something very important missing in the science, which of course was the soul, the soul side of it. I mean, I could tell stories about calcium princesses and carbon princes, you know, like I just did, and that's all great. That's very soulful, but there was some, I don't know, there was some, it could go more deep, one could develop it more somehow, I didn't know how. When I found the alchemy, I realized this is, this is how to do it. First of all, it's, it's our own Western tradition, which is nice, we can feel comfortable in that much as we love other traditions, you know, to have your own Western tradition is really nice. Mm. We're not t totally hopeless Westerners um, in terms of soul, you know, and then, well then I just started ri writing it, basically, 
in a very relaxed sort of way. I, I, have, I had a dream as well, which I write about. I start the book with the dream with this old Bulgarian peasant woman. It's classic, you see. She came to me on a boat in the sunshine on the Mediterranean somewhere, probably, with loads of young people having parties, and there she was, you know, this old Bulgarian peasant woman sitting all by herself on this boat. I didn't know what the hell I was doing on that boat either. And I, of course, I, was, I really liked her. I was very attracted to her. So I sat down next to her, and she sort of... We found each other just holding hands. I, this, I didn't write about this. In the, this is what sort of happened. When I relive it now, and she's saying, I need your help. I need your help. You're a scientist, aren't you? I need your help. And I walked her along. She walked along somewhere. She was going to her cabin, I guess, and I was holding her hand. I said, I need your help. I, need, I, I was looking for a scientist. I think you'll, you'll do. And then, basically, somehow the idea of writing this book came up. I mentioned it to her. I think you're writing a book called Gaia Alchemy. What do you think? Oh, yes. She looked at me and very happy. There's a gleam in her eye. Oh, this is very good. Very good. And then she went off so sort of sprightly into the, towards her cabin. One idea that's, that's important to get this is imagination isn't just inside you you're inside imagination and that's just really simple because we co-evolved within this planet we're part of the planet's matter as i'm listening to you tell tell me about um the rocks in the carbon cycle i'm seeing a communion of of organisms that that's co-evolved over a vast span of time and it's in this stefan harding shape for now and it's telling me things, <laughs> and I am as well. And so, as a, as a kind of uh, node of this home planet, it's becoming more aware of itself through these conversations and this technology that's going out and people listening to it. And that's that's quite a, a nice straightforward forward way of um, loosening the, a sense of what psyche is and what soul is. It's a property of human beings and a property of the world, and human beings are a property of the world as well. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, I think it makes it very earthy, doesn't it? Earthy. Earthy, so, you know, you were mentioning earlier... Grounded. Grounded, yeah. Very grounded, what you said, because you were mentioning earlier <coughs> how it's in every atom and every molecule, you know, it's, it is, it's everything, every, it's very grounded. Soul is indissoluble from matter. And if we just forget about the cosmos in a way, that's almost too big to handle. For now. For now, yeah. <laughs> it's too big. You just think about the Earth. It's about the guy. I just think about guy. That's enough. Um, how amazing that that um, there's this distributed intelligence you were talking about in the roots of plants, in micro, in fungi, in bacteria, in rocks, in ma in rocks, water, and atmosphere themselves. You know, it's a distributed intelligence. But you could describe it scientifically through complex, using complexity theory, you could say, it's all cognition. It's all exchange of information. It's all information exchange. It's all, you know, you can't model it mathematically, it's too complex, but it's, it's a scientifically plausible idea that when, say, a hydrogen uh, ion, H+, plus, is attracted to, say, a negative ion, say, Cl-, minus chlorine, you know, that's there's cognition going on there. They, they, somehow they know each other, they move towards each other. It's not a mechanical process, it's a psychic process. Yeah, and, and mechanics is included Absolutely. within psyche. Yeah. It's included, of course. But, yeah. But in, in the case of, well, anyway, we shouldn't get into what's going on in the level of the ions, because it's actually quantum mechanical. It's not really mechanical at all. I wish they hadn't used mechanics. They had to, th they had to throw the word mechanics along with the word quantum so they wouldn't get to their minds blown too much, you know. It's not mechanics. <laughs> it's not mechanics. Anyway, never mind about that. Yeah, when, <laughs> when I hear mechanics, I just hear um, a desire to figure out how things work. Oh, I see, yes. Well, that's another meaning of it. Yes, of course. Yeah. What's the mechanism? I try to, I try to avoid the word mechanism. Yes, yeah. Uh, it being linked to mechanical yeah. philosophy. Pogs and wheels. Uh, absolute predictability, 
cogs and wheels and mastership and domination of nature, um, mostly by the male sky god. Right. Or, or his henchmen, male scientists, you know, members of Plato's Academy. Not Plato's Academy, sorry, Bacon's Academy. Right. Mm. This is tough terrain to... I can't believe you, you, you wrote a book about this. <laughs> it's not that difficult. Yeah. It's not. Well, I mean, on a very basic level. I mean, I think it's very basic. It's like sort of builders. Not, I mean, I'm being bad about builders, aren't I? But you know, it's like sort of builders' tea, um, rough wine, attempt, first attempt. Because all it does, all I'm doing is I'm yeah. taking, a fe a, say, uh, several chemical images. Let's have the Azoth mandala. Right. You know, with uh, with seven chemical op alchemical operations. And all I do is I apply them to the earth. I mean, you know, it's, no, it's not very highfalutin stuff. Just, okay, where in the earth is, and to Gaia, I mean, where in Gaia is their calcination? Well, it obviously, it's all over the place. Mm. You could say metabolism is calcination. The sort of thing I discussed with Jeffrey a lot mm. when he was here a few summers ago. Um, calcination, plate tectonics, melting of rocks, volcanoes, heat, that's calcination. The first impact, the, the coming together of all the, oh, sorry, after this, sorry, before there was a, 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 a solar system, the big star that exploded and formed, formed lots of dust that grains that bumped into each other and became red hot through the energy that they produced, that, that's calcination, and they became the planets. Dissolution is when the water arrives on the planet and starts weather, weathering every, or chemicals out of the rocks. And then... Separation is when those chemicals feel themselves to be separate last, you know, in a watery environment, and they think to themselves, hey, hey, let's get together and let's see what we can do on this planet, and that's conjunction. That's when the first life appears. They can, all the molecules that have been weathered out of the rocks, conjoin into a living cell. And that's astonishing, you know. First, last universal common ancestor, Luca, and then eventually the bacteria. And then, um, the sun is the symbol of that because of life, you know, boom. The sentience that's in nature has now been intensified massively in the, in the world of the bacteria. They're talking to each other, they have chemical language. They, have, may, they build complex communities like stromatolites. They amazing level of intelligence, a real intensity. It's like a sun li lighting up the bacterial biosphere. Poof. Especially when, of course, they, they crack the art of using sunlight to split water and we get oxygenic photosynthesis and the bacteria spread all over the planet. That becomes Gaia, that's conjunction. For some, somehow the way it's being taught, not always but often, it just sucks all the magic out of it and it's a deeply magical, mm. awe-inspiring thing that happens. Mm. So you do photosynthesis. Oh, it's complicated. Oh, it's very complicated. I mean, I'm amazed that my scientific colleagues, you know, Real, better, much better scientists than me were able to tease that out. It's unbelievable. Unbelievably complex. I mean, basically, I, I don't think... Well, I'll try and do, I'll try and do what I can, but it's compli complex. Basically, the oxygen and the hydrogen in the water, in water molecules, don't want to let go of each other. So I often do this, you know, the oxygen and the hydrogen, they're like this. And the bacteria, they don't need the oxygen, at least not the photos, well they do, but let's keep it simple. Imagine they don't need the oxygen that's in the water, they need the hydrogen and the electrons, that's what they want. They want the electrons so they, in the water, or the hydrogen in the water, so they can charge them up with solar energy and gradually extract that energy down a whole complicated chain of very gradual chemical reactions in which which are used to pump hydrogen ions from one side of a membrane to another side of the membrane. It's like your waterfall. So it creates, so the solar energy is being used to energize electrons in water. And those electrons are being, the energy in those electrons are being, is being used to pump hydrogen ions from one side of a membrane to another, creating a, a difference of potential between one side of the boundary and the other, just like a river at the top of a hill and the river at the bottom. And then, you, you won't believe it, and you know, these electrons, there's a, whole, there's a whole string of them that are used. They pass from one chemical to another. Every time they pass from one to a chemical to another, the energy is used to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane. And then there's another zap of, sun, some, another zap of sunlight. Just when the electrons think, that's it, we can't do any more work. 
bang, they get another zap of sunlight, of solar energy, and then off they go again. They get excited, a very high state of energy, and that energy is gradually creamed off by this sort of stairwell of reactions that pumps more hydrogen ions across the membrane until you get to the end. And at the end, there's so much hydrogen, it literally goes through a, a circular chemical structure, the hydrogen ions. They go through a circular chemical structure, and as they go down through the structure, their energy, the potential energy, is trapped in another molecule, and then it's sent on in its way. Meanwhile, the hydrogen f meets up with that energy in another cycle, in the dark reactions, where it's combined, that energy which has, which has now been creamed off the hydrogen ions is now used to put the hydrogen and the carbon from the atmosphere together. The carbon dioxide has been, sorry, the carbon has been sucked in from the atmosphere. It's now CO2. It's now meeting those, those, elect, those um, hydrogen ions. And the energy that's left over is now f used to fuse them together into sugars, basically. And when the plant needs more energy, it breathes in some of the oxygen it's, ex it's exhaled to break down the sugars through another amazingly complex set of processes, also involving pump piping, hi pumping hydrogen ions across the membrane. Oh, it takes some oxygen back in. Yeah, they, plants use breathe oxygen. They need it to break, oh, sorry, to break down the sugars that they've made, yeah. They respire, in other words. Anima, in Latin, also means atmosphere. You know, we get anemometer, the instrument for measuring aspects of the atmosphere, from anima. So the soul and this instrument for measuring at the atmosphere have the same root. So, and David Abraham in his book, Spell of the Sensuous, goes into this a lot, you know, into how the air is considered to be the soul in many cultures. Indigenous cultures, I think ancient Greek culture, if I remember. So it's, yeah, it's a sentient being. You're coming in through the window, going out through the door here probably hearing our conversation in some way and gifting us the gift of oxygen which is, makes us alive. So um, our consciousness is impossible without the atmosphere and yet it's invisible, we take it for granted, you know. But it's, it's important to realize that it was through the atmosphere that Lovelock first glimpsed Gaia. Um, in fact his first paper, mentioning the word Gaia, uh, I mean scientific paper, sorry, in fact, his first scientific paper on Gaia, mentioning Gaia, is called Gaia as Seen Through the Atmosphere. I've got it just there. Very short paper. Gaia as Seen Through the Atmosphere. Yes, and one of the, the, the symptoms that maybe the modern world, the, the world we live in now, that I sometimes call boring culture, um, that how, how um, blinkered we are, is that we hardly ever remember our breath, that we're breathing this ancient, yeah. life-sustaining substance mm. that, that, that partly comes out of this, this, this process that you're trying to elucidate mm. um, in, in your book. Yeah. And, you know, even, even, even me, who's you know, had an unusual upbringing, brought up in a, in a circus, you know, by strange parents, I forget all the time that I'm actually breathing. Mm. And it's this, this invisible stuff that keeps me alive mm. and connects me to all other living creatures, and not only living creatures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it carries all our, our, our thoughts, our voice. Not only our voices, but the voices of the birds, the wrens, the, um, the wings of the dragonfly mm -hmm. flying mm -hmm. past your ear. Mm -hmm. um, everything that's ever been spoken, ever been heard, ev every song that's ever been sung, has been held and carried in this invisible life-sustaining medium that we call the atmosphere that we're breathing right now. Yeah. Who knows, maybe it has some kind of memory of everything that's been, all the sound it's, it's carried. Maybe all those sounds are somehow remembered, you know, in some way. Maybe the atmosphere is somehow intelligent. Maybe if you go into a temple, in a sacred temple in India, and you breathe the air, maybe that air might carry some of the m memory of the sacred mantras that have been chanted in there. I know it's a bit fanciful, but maybe, maybe, maybe. How do we know that in some way an oxygen atom or a CO2 molecule or an oxygen molecule, they somehow, you know, they hear a, a mantra being chanted, Ooh, oh, 
and they vibrate, they feel the vibration, they transmit the vibration in sound. Maybe in some way, I mean it's very far-fetched from a scientific point of view, of course it is, but not from a poetic point of view. Maybe in some way they carry that mem memory of the Om that they've been transmitting, it's affected them in some way. Well one idea of, of myth that I got from uh, Sean Kane is that myth is the song of the land heard sung back to itself that human beings overhear and participate within. So it's the idea of myth as the song of the living earth mm -hmm. that human beings overhear and participate within. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that song and all those sacred stories of cultures throughout time are carried in they carried in song and they carried in a spoken word and so both of those are held and only made possible mm -hmm. by this in, invisible mm -hmm. surrounding stuff that's always moving mm -hmm. always animate mm -hmm. that we call the atmosphere yeah and it's one of those four magical four alchemical components that together build the alchemical vessel which is our planet Gaia it's an alchemical vessel it's a vessel for transformation and we just think of all the evolution that's happened in the Dar you know, Darwinian sense from the last universal common ancestor the first living being which we mentioned in, in um, conjunction when we talked about conjunction that was the fourth I think operation you know, and then it just develops, it, it develops, it develops, life develops. It's, it's evolutionary, it's transformational. This alchemical vessel is all about transformation, just like alchemy is, because it's alchemi the planet is an alchemical vessel. It's, and so the next stage is fermentation, and I think that's when you get these bacterial feedback loops involving physical fermentation and the development of more complex ecologies. And then distillation, you could say, the next operation, Maybe that's when, possibly, when the life moves onto the land and starts weathering the rocks, like you were speaking of earlier, and that helps to distill the whole planet into a much more refined form of planetary self-regulation, particularly of temperature. And then the last one, coagulation, that's when, you could say, when the, the, the regulation, the climate regulation, the temperature regulation works really well. You've got this beautiful dynamic across the whole planet, life, atmosphere, rocks and water, working really beautifully together, at least for a while. Boom. you get a moment of Gaia and coagulation which might dissolve later you know because it has to be it does change because it goes back into calcination you might get a massive outpouring of volcanic material and CO2 or you might get a meteorite impact and the whole thing goes back into calcination and goes round again I mean there have been these big extinction crises five of them until we came along we're creating the sixth all mostly due and I think all of them certainly four or five of them due to calcination, literal calcination through volcanic activity. And also, finally, coagulation is also when we, our consciousness, as you were saying, through myth, through story, through hearing, through spoken word, wake up and coagulate with Gaia. We become, our boundaries dissolve. We realize that, like my friend David Abraham would say, that the earth, Gaia, is our wider body. We have that experience. I call it being gaia And And that's, that's when human consciousness coagulates. And that, that's when I think you find the Philosopher's Stone. You know, you could say, these are Philosopher's Stones. If you meditate on chalk, the relationship between chalk and granite, put them between you, you know, something happens, <laughs> just a sort of... But they're both Philosopher's Stones. Yeah. That it's not a literal stone, and you're you're putting your yourself between the stones, and you're mediating something of the quality and presence of the stones, and um, to to um to know them more deeply, and to know your yourself as a property of or 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 a an animal citizen of yeah exactly our living planet. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all part of the, these stones and myself and you and everyone, they're all part of the same process. You know, these have been temporarily extracted from the body of Guy and put into our study here. But eventually they'll flow back into her. So you feel a kinship with stones? Oh yeah, God, you bet I do. 
yeah, massive kinship with stones. And, and with atmosphere and water and life, but m with rocks, absolutely massive. Um, in the in the Gaia Alchemy, I described the Gaia scope. Do you remember the Gaia scope? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one of my favorite Gaia scope triplets for contemplating Gaia is rocks, water, sensing. So, so let's explain what is it? It's a, a series of concentric circles <laughs> yes. that you can move in relation to each other. Yeah, and each circle has four words. The inner circle has the words from Gaia and science. This is from science. The four components we've been speaking of. Rocks, atmosphere, earth, and life. Then the middle circle has um, the three alchemical elements, which are both uh, physical, but also psychological. Earth, air, fire, and water. And the outer circle has the four um, ways of knowing that Jung described, but which are archetypal, uh, archetypal thinking, and their opposites, thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuition. You see, these circles can be moved in relation to each other to give 64 triplets, three-word combinations, which one can use for um, cultivating Gaia alchemy. Um, one of my favorites is rocks, water, sensing. And I like to go down to our stream here and sit down in the stream with the rocks and feel how they are, the rocks are sensing the water flowing over them, actually f sensing the temperature of the water. Rocks, water, sensing. Uh, but also how the rocks become like water sensing themselves. They develop the quality of sensing like water through contact with the water. Rocks, water sensing. And then the water is also sensing the rocks. So it's rocks, water sensing. The water is also feeling the hardness and solidity of the rock and the seeming impermanence of the rocks and it takes on some of those qualities they learn from each other as they sense each other uh, in the bottom of the stream and so AI back social media we've got CRISPR now we can edit genes we've got all kinds of like hypersonic missiles nuclear warheads um, there's a sort of democratization of weaponry. It's a very dark situation. How, how do you yourself deal with that or contend with that? Um, what do you think is an appropriate response? Hmm. Was, well, you're right. These, these are very dark times, very dangerous, very dark times for all, all sorts of reasons that you've mentioned. How do I deal with it? Sometimes I can't deal with it and I just get very depressed. I think it's not perfectly okay to feel depressed. But the way I deal with it is I go to my Gaia place. So I have several Gaia places here. We're lucky to have a, a, a piece of land, a small piece of land, more or less wild, um, near the Schumacher College, where I can go and just sit with a particular tree who is my friend. Several trees. I can sit by the Wren Brook, I've mentioned. And if I stay long enough there, uh, I can feel good again. And the other thing I do is the deep time walk. So that is, um, I'm going to set one up here on our land. I've just been doing all the calculations. It's taking me about three days. But the idea is, uh, the, uh, the original, the, what we do at, at the college is 4.6 kilometers, which represents 4,600 million years of Earth, Gaia's life, which is how old she is, a bit less actually. And we walk, take a group of people walking through that story. And on that scale, every millimeter is a thousand years. And every meter is a million years. And we just walk and walk. And I, I say what happened when the bacteria came, etc., etc. When, the, when the, the land is colonized only 500 meters before the end of the walk. And then I describe what's. So people get the last fifth of a millimetre, 200 years, that's the Industrial Revolution. You walk for hours, you know, the last fifth of a millimetre the Industrial Revolution. I do that. I like to do that. I'm going to set one up on, on our land here over 552 metres. So I had to do all the calculations to scale it down. I find that's very, really connects me and with the, the long, deep time story of the Earth. 
which gives me some kind of hope. So a few things for this. One, one of them is embracing uncertainty in a deep way, like Joanna Macy talks yeah, about. Yeah, that's right. None of us know what's going no. what's going to happen. But with that, you can't use that as a get-out clause to get away from grief no. and going through the grief and feeling yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you saying in a, a, a video once that if you don't feel depressed, then you should go to a therapist to figure out what's wrong with you. It's natural. It's good to be depressed. I mean, how could you not be depressed when you think about what's going on in the world? You know? Yeah. But on the other hand, feeling depression like that about it makes you realize that you're human. It's, it's okay. It's a good response. If you don't, if you're indifferent, that's really serious. And if you're depressed, take the, take the depression to a tree. Take the depression. I, I remember Thomas More talking recently about what Hillman told him about depression, which is carry it around in a suitcase. So don't try to get rid of it, but don't let it take you over. Just keep it in a little suitcase like that and carry it around with you. And then when you get a chance, you know, open up the suitcase, let it look at the alchemical sun and moon, or something like that. That's the alchemy, you see. The alchemy can take you into the healing space. It takes you beyond all that into the source of, of psyche the sun and moon, the, the alchemical operations, the mandala, the splendor solis, you know, the rosarium philosophorum. You just take any of those images and dwell with them. In your Gaia place is better, or use the Gaia scape, this is what I do. And suddenly it's as if, um, how can I put it? It's as if something touches you from the world and you feel it's all okay really, even if everything gets burnt up in a massive planetary calcination. It's still okay, because the universe is learning through all this. The universe is a, is a learning organism. And through all this tragedy, there's some, something learnt which needs to be learnt. Something like that. Could you encourage the people watching to claim a Gaia place? What is it and can they have one? Everyone can have one. Even if you're stuck, like some of the people I worked with in, in an apartment in Brazil during the lockdowns there. You can have some plants inside your room. I've got some here in our, my house, in our house, for the winter when it's so cold outside, a little group of plants. It's my indoor Gaia place. So a Gaia place is a place not far from where you are, so you don't want to spend too long getting there where you can just, you go back again and again and again and you just, uh, you be there, you can sit there you can do your work on your dreams there, you can ask for help understanding your dreams, you can ask for help understanding, you can ask for understanding whatever understanding you need, you ask and you, you listen to the, the sound of, of the sounds in your Gaia place sometimes there's traffic noises and things, you just listen to all of that and a sort of peace comes over you, a kind of a kind of, a kind of Gaia sort of peace comes over you, a comforting comes over you, and in that comforting, insights arise, and you get some understandings. Your dreams seem to make sense, you, and you feel the touch of an intelligence in the world, and that intelligence touches you and heals you, and you become one with that intelligence. You, you know each other, you develop a relationship with that intelligence, which can see you through the most difficult things. If only we can cultivate it properly and sufficiently, which is not easy in these times. And that's, that's, that's how I see a Gaia place. And what's more, the Gaia place is also a place where, th through looking at the different rocks, water, organisms, and the air in that place, you can, they can take you into the whole of the life of Gaia as a single living planetary organism. They sort of invite you. Sometimes it might be the atmosphere, sometimes it might be the water, sometimes it might be the bird song, sometimes it might be the rock, sometimes it's all together. They, you suddenly get the feeling that you, 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 it's as if your boundaries start to expand and you feel to the, your north, you know, whatever, you go up to the Arctic and you feel the Arctic, to the south you feel the Antarctic, and east and west you feel all the, all the biomes in the, in, on land and ocean, they suddenly start becoming present to you and you there's a whole you feel yourself on this great round organ a huge round organism hurtling through space not a blue dot but 
a green paradise, a vast green spherical living planetary paradise. Um, with the desire for her own self-realization, which we humans are totally important for, one way or the other. Uh, so that's a that's that's a the power of, the, of a Gaia place. Some people call it sit spot. That's fine, but I prefer to call it Gaia place because there's the Gaia dimension. There's the whole dimension of the whole planet as one great organism. So you can feel, if, imagine if you're a forest, in a forest, you feel the forest as one organism. All around you, the forest as one organism. And then the nearby, if you're near the ocean, the nearby ocean, yes, I, as I've just explained, you know, somehow your sense of the planet becomes expansive. But you're still in one place, grounded in that place. Um, so I'd recommend, everyone should, I, everyone could have a Gaia place like that, and if you want to have a Gaia place, I think the minute you connect with the idea of a Gaia place, there'll be a Gaia place waiting for you. I think Gaia place is just waiting for humans, for us to tune in to the possibility of having one. And when we do, <laughs> Gaia places around you wake up and they start calling to you. Probably and closer than you think. Closer than you think, yes. I mean, <laughs> it can be... Sometimes a Gaia place can be a, a fly on your kitchen table. You suddenly realize it's sort of to do with consciousness. I'm, here I am, there's the fly. I'm conscious of the fly. And suddenly it be, you become partners in Gaia. You, the fly, the table. Um, but the fly will fly off, of course. Whereas a Gaia place should be there for you. Or you when, and you go there and you s spend time with her or it. I don't like to say the word it. You spend time there and you just rest there quietly. You let it teach you. You let it heal you. Um, but there's a guy place calling for you, waiting for you, not far from where you are. Maybe in a little nook in your garden, maybe in a park, maybe a, with some plants you've bought for your apartment in a high-rise building. Maybe there's a guy place for everybody just waiting. I think that's a good note to end on yeah. because this is going on YouTube. <laughs> so don't watch another video. Go and find a guy a place. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Stefan. That was Pleasure. great. Really good having a chat. That was fun. Great, yes, it's very, really very good. Well, I'll now, get the, the wire. So you oh, yes, get the wire. I'll let you, uh, okay, thank you for watching all the way to the end. Wasn't that good? He's an amazing man. I love Stefan Harding. I could talk to him all day. If you enjoyed this conversation and you want more of them to exist, obviously not only with Stefan, we can't have a podcast that consists of only Stefan Harding conversations, as amazing as that would be. But yeah, you can support us on Patreon and also by signing up to Talismans Against Boring Culture, the most vibrant newsletter uh, that's where I explore well, different, whatever I'm interested in, really. Often they'll riff on things I've spoken about with my guests on this podcast. But yeah, it's, it's a way of doing ideas um, with passion and excitement. So if that sounds of interest, head on over there and thanks for watching.